Good evening. This is Uta King Seminar. Today is March 11th. So, uh, I hurt my back. It's gradually recovering, but the pain isn't going away so quickly. Channel open late today? No, I don't think so. I heard the system changed. You used to be able to start entering the channel three minutes before it opened, but now you can't. Anyway, let's get started. Today I'll talk about the castle of Cagliostro. While I was getting ready, I realized I couldn't fit the lecture into one seminar. I'm almost thinking, maybe I'll have to break it down into three. To avoid that, I'll try to talk faster than usual to fit it into two. I don't think 90 minutes are enough. So, if any of you want to go to the bathroom, you should go whenever you want to. I think the entire seminar will be about two hours. Okay, guys? Oh, how's my throat? Well, it's not perfect. Oh, well, I took some medicine, so at least I can say I'm okay now. Okay, let's put this away. I have so many items to show today, so I'll have to do this a lot. Um, now let's begin. So tonight's going to be the first half of the Castle of Cagliostro lecture. So, um... For today, what we'll look at in the first half is the pre-credit. It's the sequence that comes before the opening. Then I'll give you a question, like a popular quiz show, Discovery of the World's Mysteries. And then we'll talk about the secret of the perfect opening. Why is the opening of Cagliostro perfect? Am I the only one thinking so? Maybe, but I'll analyze why I think so. Then, Buddha Cagliostro. Um, like another Japanese TV show, Buddha Tamori or Tamori Wanderabout, I'll virtually tour inside the world of Cagliostro and talk about its landscapes. I even made a model for that. So we'll simulate what Hayao Miyazaki pictured in his head. And the last topic is going to be Miyazaki in the dream world, where I'll answer the questions I gave you guys earlier. And in the middle, I think... The free part will end before I finish talking about the opening. But, oh well, that's how it's going to be. Honestly, this week and next week are going to be super dense lectures on Cagliostro. So, I recommend you to subscribe to the membership to avoid extra work. A week after these two lectures, I'll relax a bit. Then, feel free to unsubscribe. You can become a paying member now and simply cancel it after you watch the two lectures. So, let's start. The Lecture of the Castle of Cagliostro. Okay, so I'll talk about the pre-credit of the Castle of Cagliostro. Pre-credit is the section of a film before the title appears. We also call it avant-title in Japan. So we'll start from there. This is the first scene. You see the film company logo, then the name of the production company, then this is the first scene of the actual movie. There's some kind of a wire set on the wall of a building that brings down bags of money. Then Daisuke Jigen comes down with a happy face, then Lupin also with the happy face. This first scene tells you that something is going on. The point is this window. The light inside the room comes on while Lupin is going down the wire. Then the chase begins. The light turning on inside the room indicates that Lupin stole money from this large building and the people inside noticed it. It also reveals what this building is. And that's, um... It says Monaco, right? Here. This is a government-run casino. So, Lupin and Jigen have stolen money from a casino that the government manages in Monaco. The room in which the light just came on is probably the room in the corner of the top floor. They must have secured the wire around here. When they come down, many rooms turn on their lights. Then the two run from the back towards the screen. 
And you can also tell that it's night. It says Lupin stole 5 billion. I'm sure that's dollars. If you convert that to yen, they've stolen about 600 billion yen, which should be enough for both of them to quit thieving and retire for the rest of their lives. A comment just asked, how many dollar bills is 5 billion? But maybe they've stolen bonds, not just cash. Anyway, the scene starts from this escape. It's fun to look at the design of the casino. I heard the design source is a love hotel in Meguro called Meguro Emperor. So they run and men come after to catch them. Then, here comes an Italian car, Fiat 500. They hop on it and continue the escape. Then, do you see right here? It's hard to tell, but that's Goemon. He's sticking out the tip of his head from the car window. And you can also see the pattern of his trademark sword, Zan Tetsuken. It's clearly drawn here. A storyboard instruction clearly says, please draw a stick here. The message here is simple. In the early stage of production, Miyazaki didn't want to include Goemon in the movie. He just wanted the story of the castle of Kaliyasu to be about Lupin and Jigen. However, the company scolded him and said, enough crap, Goemon is a must, so is Fujiko. So he reluctantly included Goemon. So Miyazaki had to hint the existence of Goemon in different scenes. As a result, you can have glimpses of Goemon's head and his sword in the backseat of the Fiat. You'll see these in a scene later. Miyazaki managed to skillfully include Fujiko in the story, but Goemon remains as this minor character without any particular role until the end. But that also maintains the focus of the movie to a buddy movie between Lupin and Jigen. So I think this was a good choice. But still, you can clearly tell that Goemon was in that car by looking at this. The car of the bodyguards is sliced into two pieces. If you think about it, who else can do this except for Goemon? Because Miyazaki hated to deliberately draw Goemon, he intentionally excluded the scene where Goemon is slicing the car. Instead, he shows the result. So this is what you can do the next time you watch Kaliostro on Friday Roadshow. As soon as you see this scene, you can tweet, That's Goemon! So after that, Lupin and Jigen drive the Fiat through the highway extremely happily. <laughs> the scene after the chase is suddenly this happy driving scene. They play music like, Look at how happy Lupin looks. He looks so content. And he's driving the car so roughly. It zigzags from the left lane to the right and right to the left. It's so rough that the driver behind it gets shocked. And, however, what I thought was clever was that Miyazaki let the car do the acting instead of the people. Lupin's facial expression doesn't change. Instead, he exaggerates the movement of the Fiat to show Lupin and Jigen are overly celebrating the successful steal. The car threads its way between other cars until suddenly Lupin realizes the bills were fake. And as soon as he says that, the car starts slowing down. The Fiat pulls over to the shoulder of the road. Then, the other cars speedily pass it, one after another. Just before, the Fiat was passing other cars, threading its way through. But, the instant Lupin is disappointed, the car slows down and is passed by all other cars. This is acting through change in speed. It's easier to use speed in acting. Especially this scene is just a view from above. It's clever because this can reduce the number of drawings. The cleverness you can see in Cagliostro is, how should I say, acting this is usually done through lines. But here Miyazaki does it all through motions. And those motions are extremely limited. This movie is full of such clever ideas. 
That's the reason why many people call the Castle of Cagliostro a textbook of animation. Now, after Lupin realizes that the bills are fake, Lupin tells Jigen, let's throw them away. And he says, these are fake. These are gothic bills. Lupin sighs. They can now even sneak into government-run casinos. But he then says, great, Jigen, we've got our next job. Let's celebrate. And what he does to celebrate is to, yes... He opens the ceiling of the car and suddenly starts scattering the gothic bills. By the way, here, that's uh, Goemon's head. And this tiny stick is his sword. <laughs> He's really there, isn't he? Miyazaki must have really hated to put him in there. <laughs> Okay, now, back to Lupin and Jigen. They say, let's celebrate. When I saw this scene, I knew it was a crazy amount of work to draw each single bill like that. I was astonished to see these bills fly in the air, but that wasn't the end. I thought, how the hell did all the bills fit inside that small car? Because they flow out like a storm. And they all fly out to the sky. And from here, the opening starts. But before the opening, did you notice? It was night when they first attacked the casino. But in the scene where they hop in the car, the night is almost ending. The day gradually breaks as the car is running. It was a little past 4 a.m. that they cracked the safe of the casino. While they are running, the day slowly breaks. The sky becomes brighter and at the end you see the fake bills flying toward the blue sky. Very dynamic. Then, the opening starts. You see, it's a progression from the night which sets a dark tone with stealing, but the tone lightens up as the day breaks. Also, the car moves from a crowd to an open space as it passes the traffic jam on the highway, one after another, until there aren't many cars around. This is called escape in animation, where the camera moves from somewhere crowded to a clear view. So that's the pre-credit sequence. So after you see the bills flying in the air, you hear music. Then the opening starts. The famous opening of the Castle of Cagliostro. I'll talk more about this opening later on in the lecture. The aesthetic significance of the Castle of Cagliostro is the change in tones and compositions between scenes. They are either dark and compressed or pressured, or bright, open and clear. If you pay attention to these changes, you'll enjoy the movie more. It's 15 minutes already. Okay. Now, <coughs> today I won't talk about anything that is clear to anyone's eyes. Instead, I'll imitate the method of discovery of the world's mysteries. Which means I'll look for mysteries inside the movie. Then I'll try to solve those mysteries. Now, back to the pre-credit. When the movie came out, many enthusiastic fans said that something was strange about the pre-credit sequence. There was a TV show called BS Anime Talk. When I was in that show, I also said that there was a contradiction. And what that is, is that so Lupin steals fake bills from the casino. He says, they can now even sneak into government-run casinos and throws them away because they are fake. But isn't that strange? I mean, a government-run casino couldn't tell they were fake? That means Lupin can use those bills just fine. And he stole five billion dollars worth of them? Why throw them away? But some people say, nah. 
Some of those who love Lupin from their hearts say, No, Lupin only loves authentic things. Then in the climax, why does Lupin chase Fujiko who runs away with the original edition of the fake bills like, No, Fujiko-chan, what is that all about? Now he wants fake bills? So there's the contradiction. Many fan magazines have pointed this out since the movie opened in theaters. The question is, why did Miyazaki portray it in such a way? Well, some people say Miyazaki respects imagery more than plot, or like someone just commented, he had pride as a thief. Possible, but if he had such pride, then again, why would he care about the fake bills? I mean, if there are such elaborate fake bills that a government-run casino or even Jigen can't tell they are fake, Lupin being a master thief could have decided to create his own fake bills that are better than gothic bills. Lupin making his own fake bills can easily become a TV series episode. But why didn't he? Why did he toss them? So, I will set this as a question or a mystery for today's lecture. But first of all, let me ask you, why did Lupin toss the bills? Many of you have written comments earlier. And I have my own answer to that question, which I will tell you at the end of today's lecture. But let me see what you all think first. Okay, he thought of Clarice, he got upset, it was against his motto, to sell, it was mortifying, Miyazaki wanted a cool opening, it's his pride, to challenge again, he was young, he hates imitation, Hayao showed off his drawing skills, <laughs> Hayao was being random, nice, okay, now, there is a reason for this mystery, and I think the reason is hidden in the answer to the question, why did Miyazaki make the Castle of Cagliostro in the first place? The clue to that answer can be found from the year after the release of the Castle of Cagliostro. There was an interview in October 1980, exactly a year after the release, in a magazine called Animeiju. He said, all that's left for Lupin to do after being left alone in the real world is to steal a young girl's heart. That's it. It sounds a bit negative, doesn't it? When Miyazaki said, steal young girl's heart, he was referring to the famous climax scene where Inspector Zenigata says, he stole something of no small value, your heart. And this is supposed to be a great line that moves everyone's heart. But what Miyazaki really meant was that Lupin was an unworthy man who was only able to steal a girl's heart. And that's because he was left alone in the real world. Someone just commented, Miyazaki sounds mentally ill. Yes, he is, or more precisely. Whoever is moved by Zenigata's famous line must sympathize with Miyazaki's despair. Because it's hard to tell why he made this movie. So the question is to see how Miyazaki made the Castle of Cagliostro. To do that, I made a Miyazaki timeline Cagliostro version. Yeah, the timeline of Miyazaki is getting longer and longer every time I make one for the broadcasts. He was born in 1941, and after graduating from college, he entered toy animation. Well, I don't know if he was a full-time worker, but he was an official staff member. Then he spent three years from 1965 to 68 on The Great Adventure of Horus with Isao Takahata. And in 1971, he left toy animation with him and went to A Production to make PP Longstocking. But the project didn't start, so he joined the TV series Lupin the Third. Then, between 1972 to 73, he made the two feature films of Panda Go Panda. Then he moved to Zuyo and started preparing for Heidi, Girl of the Alps. Then, in 1974, Heidi was broadcasted. This was his first commercial success. Then he made 3,000 Leagues in Search of Mother. He gradually became a known figure among the anime industry as he grew his reputation. 
1977, a pre-production of Future Boy Conan, his first director debut on TV, which was broadcasted the next year. After that, he moved to Telecom to make Little Nemo, Adventures in Slumberland, with American creators. Miyazaki and Takahata were the Japanese director's candidates, so they went back and forth between Japan and the US. Meanwhile, in December 1979, The Castle of Cagliostro was released. Then at last, he got fed up with Nemo in 1982 and left Telecom. This is the timeline of Miyazaki in regards to The Castle of Cagliostro, and the outline of what I'll talk about today. Now, the final goal is to answer the question of why Lupin threw away the fake bills. Someone just wrote, I heard Nemo didn't complete. That's not true, it did complete, but not in the most successful way. I'll talk about this tragedy later. Well, later would be about 10 minutes from now. First of all, we need to know about the TV series Lupin the Third, which Miyazaki joined halfway through the production, before we understand what kind of anime the Castle of Cagliostro was. And to understand the TV series, we have to understand the original manga version written by Monkey Punch. Now, I want to know how many of you have read this. You have, really? <laughs> when it came out in a manga magazine, I took glimpses of it at restaurants or the dentist that I used to go to. Oh, many of you have. Nice. Good job, guys. This is how the pictures look. Like this. They're drawn in detail. Back then, the style of comics with a realistic narrative was yet to establish, so the amount of information on each page was enormous. And, um, uh, Inspector Zenigata is looking for Lupin here, but Lupin is actually hiding right here. Hold on. Can you see? This is Lupin. He's disguised and in the crowd. Yeah, this guy in glasses. This is the first chapter where Lupin comes out in the manga. Stylish pictures, huh? And of course they are stylish. It's because Monkey Punch was deeply influenced by a comic artist called Mort Drucker, who was a regular contributor to a subculture magazine called Mad in the US. So, this is an illustration by Drucker. Do you see the resemblance? For example, he drew a woman's thighs thick and waist narrow. Also, if you pay attention to people's palms and legs, you'd know. They are so large, as if these people have acromegaly. So, these are some of the characteristics of Mort Drucker's illustration. Monkey Punch was someone who took these characteristics and implemented them into the style of Japanese comic strips. Lupin III was in a magazine called Manga Action from 1967 to 69 and became his most important work. Now, his pen name, Monkey Punch, was named by the chief editor of the magazine, who also came up with the name of Ken Tsukikage. The chief editor was a strange man, like the producer of The God of Entertainment. He named manga artists as he pleased, and he didn't even discuss them. Monkey Punch didn't like the name Monkey Punch, but he thought, oh well, it's just a temporary name until this series is over. So he accepted the name, but since Lupin III became his biggest hit, he had to keep using the same name until today. <laughs> Anyway, soon after the manga became popular, its anime version was planned. You can read the background stories of this project in a book written by an animator called Yasuo Otsuka titled The Ambition of Little Nemo. This book is amazing, so you should all buy it and read. Now, I'll refer to one episode. Back then, Fuji TV broadcasted one of the first full-scale black-and-white anime series, Astro Boy, which was a hit. Their panicked rival broadcaster, TBS, decided to make their own anime as well, but there was no one to commission it to. Toei Animation stayed away from TV animes, Mushi Production was busy with Astro Boy, so they commissioned a friend of a TBS employee called Yutaka Fujioka, who was running a puppet theater at the time. 
Then, Fujioka made a company called Tokyo Movie that later made the TV version of Loop on the Third. But the request from TBS was to make an anime ASAP, so the first TV anime called Big X was on air even before the company was established. Big X was a hit, so Tokyo Movie produced the first series of Little Ghost Kyutaro. But even then, they were short of animators, so they would try to poach from Toei or Mushi Production by negotiating at their company's entrances. We'll pay you this much, what do you think? And they actually paid at the site, pretty disgusting. But Fujioka wasn't the only disgusting one, so were the animators. When they made Little Ghost Kutaro, they cheated on the numbers of their drawings. When one sheet was enough to draw Kutaro, they drew the body on one sheet, a hand on another, eyes on the third, and a mouth on the fourth, and they claimed six sheets as their workload. They ripped off amateur staff members who accepted them easily. As a result, those animators made good money. Later, Otsuka confessed that it was tough to find those cheating animators and fire them. It's a famous story. Some people say that animators have always been mistreated, but that's not true at all. They were making a sucker of those who didn't have knowledge about animation. People were living strongly back then. So, after Little Ghost Kyutaro, Tokyo Movie made Star of the Giants in color, and this was a huge hit. They grew in confidence after Star of the Giants. Next, they made Loop on the Third to target an adult audience. So, what was going on during that time? It was 1968. Lupin the Third was still in the magazine. At that time, Yasuo Otsuka, now a veteran animator who was an animation director of the Castle of Cagliostro and is still working. He is quite a character. But anyway, at that time, he was at a racing circuit in Chiba for his hobby. I don't mean a racing circuit for toy cars. You take your own car there and race. So, Otsuka owned the same Fiat that Lupin drives in the anime. It was Otsuka's favorite car. He drove his Fiat to Chiba and raced around the circuit vigorously. He was in the actual competitions, so he was playing the real games. One day, he noticed this strange guy who had always come and sat near him. He was wearing light brown sunglasses and he could see his thin, shady looking eyes through the lens. And the guy went, this place is amazing, so what do you do for a living? Oh, anime, huh? Erg, Japanese animes don't know how to draw cars. Then he said, so you are an animator, can you draw these real cars racing in the circuit this powerfully? I don't think you can. I don't think any Japanese animators can. Somehow this mysterious guy kept pressuring Otsuka. Otsuka was like, what is wrong with this weird old man? The guy was actually Fujioka, the CEO of Tokyo Movie. And Fujioka was trying to headhunt Otsuka, just like he did to Mushi Production Animators. Otsuka was a staff member of Toy Animation at that time, but Fujioka wanted him in his own company and to join Lupin the Third. So he came to the auto races every week, which he wasn't really interested in, just to entice Otsuka little by little. Eventually though, Otsuka started thinking, what a weird guy, but he's kinda interesting. However, by then, Fujioka had already recruited a colleague member of his puppet theater called um, Masaaki Osumi as a director of Lupin the Third. But Lupin the Third was struggling to find a sponsor and broadcaster. They set the goal to make an anime for adults, but no one ever wanted such a thing. All animes were targeted at kids, and no matter how cheaply made, they all earned a 20% or 30% viewing rate. It was that kind of an era. A fun anime would earn 40%, boring ones 20%. So, the makers thought there was no point in doing extra work or risking themselves by making an adult-targeted anime, which PTAs would attack. Sponsors hated the idea as well. But Fujioka was an eager man. Meanwhile, he also obtained the copyright of Moomin. This was because Big X was a manga by Osamu Tezuka. Little Ghost Kyutaro was by Fujio Fujiko. 
And Star of the Giants was by Noboru Kawasaki. They couldn't make a profit out of Japanese mangas because the publishers owned the rights. Fujioka was ambitious to make his businesses bigger and global. He was one of the first people in Japan to start anime adaptations of juvenile literature. That's why he first bought the rights to Moomin and made it into an anime, which Otsuka joined as a production team member. Meanwhile, Miyazaki and Takahata thought toy animation had no future, but Tokyo Movie did for producing Moomin. So they joined A Production, which was a subsidiary company of Tokyo Movie. Then, they tried to make Pippi Longstocking there. Sorry, I'm deviating a bit. So, back to the timeline. Miyazaki and Takata joined... Okay. Right here. Uh, he entered A production in order to produce Pippi Longstocking. But even so, they couldn't receive a green light from the author of Pippi Longstocking. That's the overall flow. But Miyazaki and Takahata didn't have any clue on how Pippi Longstocking would be rejected by the author. Because they had a good feeling when they were in negotiation. But that was also when the TV version of Lupin the Third finally started. Miyazaki was interested in Lupin the Third to some extent, but didn't think it was his job to direct it. So the first season of Lupin the Third began directed by Osumi. Osumi's concept for Lupin was to set characters who reflected the post-60s young generation in Japan, who no longer had any passion or interest in politics or social activities. To be more specific, Lupin is a descendant of a French aristocracy. His grandfather, Lupin I, was the master thief. Arsene Lupin. So he's super rich. Lupin III received a great inheritance from him, so he actually doesn't need to steal. He rather wants to have fun because he's bored. That's why failing to steal doesn't mean anything to him. He just laughs it all away and indulges in women, gambling, and wine. He just lives hedonistically every day. That was Osumi's plan. And their sponsor finally accepted that plan. Because their sponsor was that well-known, cough drop brand in Japan called Asada Ame. As you all know, Asada Ame being a snack or drug company, well, it's a drug company. So, being a drug company, they couldn't allow their sponsored anime to have a main character who stole in every episode. Asada Ame's request was not to let Lupin kill people even though he's a thief. And their next request was to not let him steal things. <laughs> That's why Lupin is a thief but fails every time. Or even when he succeeds, he ends up stealing invaluable things. This was the original setting for the TV series which was kept until today. That's why although Lupin is a thief throughout the series, he rarely succeeds in thieving. <laughs> There's a scene in the opening where he is on a helicopter with a piece of jewelry he has stolen. Although there are moments, he usually fails in the episodes, but that was intentional. But that didn't matter, because in Osumi's concept, he's a descendant of aristocracy and has great wealth. Now, I wish I had a better image to show you how Lupin was drawn during that time. The whole animation team of Star of the Giants, an epic baseball manga, produced Lupin the Third. So, um... Here, Otsuka had to struggle so much to have things done properly. Maybe I'll have the image right here. Otsuka had such a difficult time. Because the animators had been drawing baseball players until recently, they drew everyone with good postures. So Otsuka had to instruct them how he needed to stand. Lupin was supposed to stand leaning on one foot, like diagonally. Without his instructions, Lupin always ended up standing like an athlete. Otsuka was like, no, make him look softer like a jellyfish. When he sits, he doesn't sit straight, make him slack every single time. He explained that over and over to the animators. So, it was a lot of work, but finally Lupin III started on TV. But, like I said, fun animes used to receive a 40% viewing rate. Even boring animes at least earned 20%. Now, guess the number of Lupin's first episode. 
9%, which dropped and dropped every episode until it was 6%. The advertising agency complained first, although they said earlier, let's make anime new for adults. Next, Asada Ame saw it as well, and they complained too. So they called Osumi to hold a response meeting. But director Osumi argued back, what's happening is exactly what we have expected. This anime is for adults, and adults don't watch anime. And 9%? A good number. But neither the sponsor or the broadcaster nodded their heads. Osumi got upset, and he stopped coming to meetings after. So Lupin pretty much lost their director around the 6th or 7th episode. Then, the people who caught Fujioka's attention were... Miyazaki and Takahata. In addition to the commercial depression of Lupin, because the anime adaptation Pippi Longstocking was rejected, Tokyo Movie was almost going bankrupt. They spent three years producing Lupin the Third, but it received only a 6% viewing rate. Not only that, a feature anime film, Pippi Longstockings, was rejected by the author. They didn't know what to do now, but they had to do something, so they forced Takahata and Miyazaki to support the first season of Lupin the Third. But in my opinion, I think they are historically the worst two to help improve the viewing rate. But they are both serious and hardworking, so they did what they could. <laughs> Miyazaki tried to completely remodel Lupin the Third. To do that, he got rid of the setting that Lupin was a French aristocrat. He replaced the setting that he was a bored rich man who stole for a hobby. Now, he was a poor Italian man who always goggled his eyes, looking for fun. It was a drastic change from French aristocrat to poor Italian man. Now, the car Lupin drove during that time, in the first season, it's a car called Mercedes-Benz SSK. Mercedes-Benz SSK is super expensive today. And it was super expensive back then. Because I think they've only made 30 of them in the world, on top of them being limited in number. SSK has a 12-cylinder piston engine that Ferrari installs. Including that engine, one SSK costs about 14 million US dollars. And that's his car? No way! You see, Lupin has indulged in luxury throughout his life, so he's bored of it. He's fed up with luxury and just wants a car that moves. Miyazaki said, oh, that looks good, and pointed at Otsuka's cherished car, Fiat 500, outside the window and said, how about that car? That looks cheap and beaten up. Otsuka said, um, that's my car. Anyway, so Fiat became Lupin's car. So, in the 16th episode of the first season of Lupin, called Operation Jewelry Snatch, there's a scene where Lupin steals Fujiko's car and drives away. After that, it becomes his car. So, you may think Fiat became his car from Cagliostro, but it was his car ever since Miyazaki joined the TV series in 1971 and brought in his own setting. In Miyazaki's mind, making the main character of anime drink expensive champagne and drive an expensive car that is super limited in number was so out of fashion. So, rather, he wanted Lupin to drive an ordinary car and be hungry for thrills, so the style shifted. I think the first season is strangely appealing because it's a good mixture of Lupin as an aristocrat as well as as a poor and hungry man. Miyazaki was also unhappy about Lupin's gun, Walter P-38, that the German military mass produced millions of. He complained, what kind of an aristocrat uses a cheap mass-produced gun like that? I thought Lupin was a French man, how dare he use Walter P-38? He also attacked how shallow the characters were. Osumi originally said his concept received inspiration from Tom and Jerry. 
You know, it's an anime series where Jerry the mouse runs away and Tom the cat gets mad and chases Jerry. Just like that, Lupin runs away and Zenigata gets mad and chases him. It's a comedy. But Miyazaki hated that idea. He said, why make another cliche anime? How are we going to make many series out of it? Lupin is not a single five minutes anime. How can Takahata and I have passion for Tom and Jerry? It was not when he made Cagliostro, but already back in 1971, Miyazaki strongly insisted that in order for the characters of Lupin to develop, it needed to be more than just playing tag. During that time, Miyazaki also clearly stated that Lupin had only been good as a manga when it had been published in 1968. Therefore, there was no place for him in 1971. He even wrote it on the project proposal. So one more time, let's go back to the timeline. So after this, after Miyazaki joined to support Lupin in 1972 and 73, he joined the production of Panda Go Panda, then moved to Zuiyo and joined the production of Heidi, Girl of the Alps. Now, after Heidi, he worked on 3,000 Leagues in Search of Mother. Sorry, this is taking long. It's already past 40 minutes, but let me continue. Unless I talk about Cagliostro, I don't think I can move on to the paid part. So, after Heidi, Girl of the Alps and 3,000 Leagues in Search of Mother ended, he started questioning his stance as an animator. Ever since he was making The Great Adventure of Horus, his role was to submit storyboards, which Takahata accepted. That's what Miyazaki always did. No matter what he did, when he thought something was interesting, he drew them, one after another, with his enormous drawing ability. When directors saw them, they couldn't refuse them. Then those new drawings changed the plot and the story became Miyazaki's. That was his strategy since he was a newbie. But for Heidi and 3000 Leagues, he couldn't do that for the first time. All he could do was to serve Takahata. Until then, Miyazaki could flip Takahata's original ideas with his storyboards. Then Takahata was like, oh, that's cool, let's use it. But because Takahata was a director who was so loyal to original stories and Heidi and 3000 Leagues had original stories, he didn't compromise to the suggestions for a change. Although Miyazaki worked so hard, he was just working as a tool to visualize and elaborate Takahata's ideas, nothing more. It was in a way ideal for Miyazaki who admired Takahata, but he could no longer do things as he wanted. I understand how he felt. I didn't want to be the representative at the Japan Sci-Fi Convention. I hated being like a leader of a committee. I rather wanted to be the second or third important figure who would suggest but does not decide. I later heard a Gainax anime producer, Taka Miyakai, also liked that position when we worked together. So did current Gainax CEO, Yamaga. Which makes it everyone. Creators love being under CEOs and representatives so that they can complain as much as they want. If their ideas get accepted, great. If not, just complain more. Miyazaki too was in that position. But Takahata finally learned how to manage Miyazaki's talent. He handled Miyazaki so well when he produced 3000 Leagues and Heidi. And as a result, when NHK offered Miyazaki to be involved in Future Boy Conan, he volunteered to be a director. At that time, he was questioning, am I just going to end up as one of the staff members? If I want to make what I truly hope to make, I have to direct. That's how he started making Future Boy Conan in 1977. However, while he was making Conan, he ran into a problem again, which I already talked about when I lectured about Raputa. It was that he, as a director, had to turn down the scenes that his colleague animators submitted. 
His colleague animators included Yasuo Otsuka, a longtime friend of Miyazaki and his elder. Otsuka also asked Miyazaki, let me draw Lana too. But Miyazaki said, you can't, you have to draw Jimzi. So he had to turn down his friend's request. Otsuka pleaded, but Miyazaki had to say, when it comes to Lana, I'm the only one who can draw her. And there were numerous similar circumstances to the point he was very depressed. He quickly lost his friends. He said, I have no friends now. When Conan ended, not only because he felt accomplished, but also because of the reason I just mentioned, he went to Takahata and begged, please let me help you with Anne of Green Gables. So he became Takahata's animator again. But as I said, the first day Miyazaki joined the team, he started criticizing another animator sitting next to him saying, you did it wrong, give it to me, and fix their drawings, which brought chaos to the studio. Moreover, Miyazaki couldn't devote himself to Anne of Green Gables, was because of Yoshifumi Kondo, aka Kibun Kondo among his fans, who later directed Whisper of the Heart. Kondo was Takahata's partner in Anne of Green Gables. Kondo was the central figure, and the world of Anne of Green Gables was created by him, who was the animation director. Miyazaki realized it was no longer the past when he could make unreasonable requests, and Takahata accepted them, so he couldn't find his place in the team. By the way, Kondo is truly a genius of anime. You remember when Takahata and Miyazaki made Grave of the Fireflies and My Neighbor Totoro respectively? At that time, they tried to steal Kondo from each other. Takahata said, you can take anyone you want except for him. Please let me have Konchan. Then Miyazaki fought back, if Konchan won't join Totoro, I won't direct. So they fought a big fight. But when they fought, they always did it directly, but both bitched indirectly to producer Toshio Suzuki. <laughs> Suzuki had a long negotiation with Miyazaki, and at the end, Suzuki said, Miyasan, you can draw, but Takahata can't. Let him have at least one skilled draftsman. It was a challenging negotiation. But while Miyazaki was crying, no, I don't want anyone else. I want Konchan. Takahata stole away Hideaki Ano as well. Quite a nerve, huh? Anyway, it was a big incident. To sum up, that's how gifted Kondo was. Now, when Miyazaki was depressed after seeing Takahata and Kondo working together for Anne of Green Gables, a new company called Telecom was about to be established. It was the animation company that later made The Castle of Cagliostro. So... Finally, we are on the later half of the timeline. Um, so Miyazaki moved to Telecom after Conan was broadcasted, then he was part of Little Nemo, he was the Japanese director candidate along with Takahata, then the castle of Cagliostro was released. What happened during this one year? Am I switching to the paid part? No, not yet. There's something I need to talk about beforehand, so I'll continue the free part a bit more. I think if I ended here, I'd be ripping you off. Sorry, it's getting hot, so let me take this off. I'm like a Rakugo storyteller. I mean, I just talked about the first two minutes of pre-credit. I think the wheel of fate began to spin. When Miyazaki went to the US for a Little Nemo, Hollywood recognized his talent. Actually, Miyazaki had no plan to direct the castle of Cagliostro. He said he had done everything in the first season of the TV series. Rather than that, the production of Little Nemo was a collaboration with Hollywood with a budget of $24,400,000. George Lucas was the producer and Ray Douglas Bradbury wrote the script. It was an incredible film. Miyazaki was supposed to direct it. This was planned by the evil producer Fujioka, as I mentioned earlier. 
When P.P. Longstocking was rejected by the author, he was already on to the next piece. His next plan was to go to Hollywood and succeed. He thought making an anime in Japan and winning a high viewing rate neither makes us acknowledged nor rich. That's wrong. So he headed to Hollywood. Look at Disney. They are successful. Osamu Tezuka, Tatsunoko Production, and Kodansha, who made Akira, all thought the same. They all wanted to go to Hollywood and make the world acknowledge Japanese anime. But when we look at history, the only guy who really went to Hollywood, rented a luxury house and lived there, interacted with the American staff for years, and actually produced an anime film, was Yutaka Fujioka. That guy with shady eyes in sunglasses. No one else could do that. And the story which he could obtain the right to was Little Nemo. Little Nemo was a weekly newspaper comic strip that was on the Sunday edition of Herald Tribune, which had the headquarters in New York City. It was in color and occupied one whole page. You see the title over here, Little Nemo in Slumberland? So it's about Nemo having a strange dream every episode. In this episode, the boy's bed grows long legs and walks out of the room. The legs get longer and longer over the buildings, but as the legs get entangled, the boy drops and wakes up from the dream. It was simple as that, but it was extremely popular back then. It was actually considered to be the most popular piece in the history of American comics. Every episode's complete in a page, and every ending was Nemo falling from the bed to wake up from his dream. But the stories varied so much. It was so popular to the point that if someone made an anime out of it, Mickey Mouse couldn't have beaten its sales. What Fujioka accomplished during this time was really incredible. Why I say incredible is because he didn't only obtain the right to make the anime version of Nemo, he also hired the members of Disney's Nine Old Men, who had made Fantasia and Snow White. Nine Old Men sounds to me like the Seven Dwarves from Snow White. Anyway, Fujioka succeeded in having Frank Thomas and Ollie Johnston join the project as technical staff. Next, he got George Lucas as the producer and Ray Bradbury as the screenplay writer. Finally, he won a contract with a sponsor from the Japanese side, that famous loan shark company, Acom. Acom became the, like a faucet where money comes out without limit. The production team consisted of both Japanese and American staff. The American technical staff, like Nine Old Men, were summoned to teach the Japanese staff animation, and those were Miyazaki, Takahata, and Yoshifumi Kondo. Fujioka took the incredible team of Japanese staff to Hollywood and had nine old men give them lessons. It hardly sounded true. What Fujioka did to have the American creators recognize Takahata and Miyazaki's talent was to make a subtitled version of The Castle of Cagliostro, which had just completed, and Chia the Brat that Takahata had directed. Fujioka held screenings in the US to promote these animes to the American staff, celebrities, movie makers, or TV producers who were interested in animation. He just showed and showed and showed. He held crazy amounts of screenings. And people were truly astonished when they saw the films. Nine old men watched Cagliostro and said, it was so well made that they doubted if there was anything they could teach its creators. Steven Spielberg also accidentally watched Cagliostro and later commented, I never shoot car chases because I can never beat the ones in Cagliostro. <laughs> it's all thanks to Fujioka's screenings about which he didn't discriminate who to show. Even John Lasseter, who later made Pixar and became a master movie director, watched it too. He wanted to join Disney to make animation, but after he was dragged into one of the screenings, he decided to become Miyazaki's apprentice. <laughs> so, the total budget of $24,400,000 was said to all come from ACOM. But if the money was properly sent and all the staff members were able to work efficiently. Miyazaki's official film in the 1980s after the Castle of Cagliostro was going to be Little Nemo. 
Miyazaki won an Academy Award for an animated feature many years later, but if he directed Little Nemo, he probably would have been able to um, prove his talent in Hollywood 20 years before that. But unfortunately, the production of Little Nemo strayed from the predicted course and couldn't get back on track. It ended up taking 10 years to complete. Meanwhile, most of the gorgeous primary members left the project and the budget, which seemed like an infinite amount, was used up including an extra $4,400,000 ACOM later added. They barely had enough to advertise. The production ended with such little money, so even though they screened all throughout the US, the sales did so poorly and accordingly, they only made about two million dollars so it was a complete failure later it won some awards in the u.s but just like Cagliostro, it wasn't a commercial success at all and fujioka died a broken-hearted man a year before the movie was released the biggest reason for the failure was that george lucas left the project first when Lucas left, he said, rather than me getting involved in animation, I know a better man. Then he introduced the producer of Star Wars called Gary Kurtz. It's been said that Kurtz was the reason everything went wrong. Well, at least that's what Otsuka said. Because every decision he made was bad. The budget amount of $28,800,000 didn't just disappear. It was all spent on the endless production. But no matter how much money they spent on storyboards, pilot films, or test shots, Kurtz would reject all of them. But the only reason to do so was just because he didn't like them. Why was he so egoistic though? Well, it was the first time for Kurtz to produce an animation, and his reference was Walt Disney. Walt Disney was also someone who only depended on his creative instinct and said, this is good or this is bad. It's been said Kurtz imitated that style. But Disney was someone who never let his people call him Mr. Disney. All employees of the Walt Disney Company called him by his first name, Walt. And Disney himself also remembered the faces of all of his employees and called them by their first names. Dictatorship works fine in such a relationship. Once they leave the workplace, the employees and the CEO are friends and families. They're equal. But the moment they started working, Disney dictated all creative decisions. It worked because there was a balance. Even so, Disney was embroiled in a labor movement with Pinocchio, which gave him a terrible experience. Kurtz imitated Disney during his golden age. But he and George Lucas were famous misanthropes, so Kurtz didn't have the same balance Disney had. So, Kurtz rejected Miyazaki's storyboards one after another. On the other hand, Miyazaki wanted to make Little Nemo his story like he had always done. So he came up with so many ideas and proposed them, which he later used for Princess Mononoke and Naushka. But Kurtz rejected them all. Not only that, he didn't explain why. Therefore, Miyazaki was the first one to leave the project. And many people later followed. Gary Kurtz and Fujioka were the only two who were in the team until the end. Kurtz kept on saying no without any reasons, so the staff had to struggle to find solutions without having many clues as to what would be acceptable. But they did finish the film, which is now on video. It's called Little Nemo, you can buy it too, but the best part is... The pilot film Kondo and Kazuhide Tomonaga made, it's a short three minute clip that you can also watch on YouTube, but it's amazing. I imagine if George Lucas was the producer, not Gary Kurtz, or if Fujioka had more control over the production than he actually did, then Takahata and Miyazaki would have stayed as the directors of the movie. Then I'm sure the cultural power relationships of the world would definitely have changed. Back in the 80s in Japan, YMO and music, Sony and technology, and the later bubble economy contributed to the world trend which was called Japan as number one. 
If Miyazaki and Takahata emerged in the world's film industry with images greater than Star Wars, Japan would have topped and ruled the world in terms of culture. This is my delusion. Japan would have topped and ruled the world. Anyway, finally back to the original topic. It's already been an hour. When there was still an infinite amount of budget and time, an animation company called Telecom Animation Film was established just to produce Little Nemo. It was the company that later produced the castle of Cagliostro. Telecom put an advertisement in a newspaper to recruit young people who had neither made nor watched TV anime before. Out of 1,000 applicants, they picked 42. There's a creator called Sadao Sukioka, who made Wolf Boy Ken all by himself. He was once an employee of Toei Animation when Toei made a TV series called Wolf Boy Ken. He wrote the original story, the storyboard, and he drew all the drawings by himself. He made the first four episodes of the series like that. Then he burned out and said, I can't do this anymore. So he finally hired a few staff members. Can you imagine making four episodes by himself? A monster. This guy, Sadao Tsukioka, came to Telecom as an educator of those 42 newbies, and it was a complete elite education. First of all, those 42 members had never made anime or preferably never seen one. They were just good at drawing. Tsukioka gave them a thorough ideological education. He told them, never watch TV animes because they're bad. You will make an amazing animation film from scratch. After he agitated everyone's minds, he said, my job is done and left. <laughs> Now, what were left were 42 amateurs who knew nothing about anime but had high self-esteem. Out of the 42, only five were men, and the rest were all beautiful women for some reason. <laughs> so, Telecom went to Otsuka and begged, We've made a production studio to make Little Nemo, but Tsukioka quit. Please help us. So, when Otsuka went to Telecom, he saw these hipsters. Among the 42, some of them were drawing, but for some reason, some were singing. And when Young Man, a famous song by Hideki Saijo, came out from the radio, everyone stood up and started dancing. YMCA. I mean, what kind of animation studio was that? Seeing the disaster, Otsuka almost panicked. And feeling desperately in need to teach them proper animation skills, he summoned Atsuko Tanaka. Do you remember the scene? Where Lupin and Jigen steal spaghetti from each other in Cagliostro? Atsuko Tanaka drew that scene. When she drew it, she had just graduated from the animation department of a design school. It was her first year as a professional. But she was extremely skilled, so Otsuka invited her as the teacher. The 42 newbies were rebellious at first. They said, we don't need to be taught, we are the creators. Thanks to the ideological education they had received, they didn't listen. But Otsuka invited the best of the best animators to teach them almost one-on-one. -on -one. Well, some still quit. But because the students were good draftsmen in the first place, their skills gradually improved within a year. Then, they briefly assisted The Mystery of Mamo, the first feature film of the Lupin series. The main staff of Mamo criticized them, saying, oh, telecom animators think highly of themselves, but they suck, which was mortifying for Otsuka. But he patiently improved their skills by holding lessons called anime seminars, which he taught as well. Then, Telecom was selected as the main studio to create the Castle of Cagliostro. Well, Fujioka estimated Little Nemo would require another two years to start. That was the main reason why Telecom was chosen. But Miyazaki panicked because he had heard the famous story of how Telecom animators had the worst skills and attitudes. But Otsuka convinced Miyazaki, I'll take care of them. We have Tanaka and Tomonaga. We are also hiring more veteran creators to educate them. Otsuka gave a thorough elite education to the animators to make Telecom ready for a feature film. 
So, in reality, Cagliostro was a film used to educate the telecom animators. The real goal of both Fujioka and Otsuka, the executives of telecom, wasn't to make Cagliostro a hit, but to later make the epic anime film Little Nemo. Therefore, they planned to enhance the skills of the anime staff by allowing them to have the experience of making a whole feature film, which happened to be Cagliostro. But, of course, Miyazaki didn't want his first feature film to be ruined like that. So, he had to somehow use those bad animators and make the film. Miyazaki had already left Little Nemo, so he felt no obligation to allow his own film to become practice material for those amateurs. The only option left was to train them to become proper animators. Meanwhile, he had to be strategic about cutting corners wherever he could, but didn't want to deteriorate the quality even by a single bit. He cut corners as much as possible while perfectly maintaining the quality. Miyazaki's determination and tenacity led to the miraculous opening of the castle of Cagliostro. Sorry guys, free part ends here. Now, <laughs> I'm sorry. I wanted to fit the lecture about the opening in the free part, but it'll take another hour. So the questionnaire, please. The second half will cover the perfect opening. It's a story about how the group of amateurs made it. And I'll do Buddha Cagliostro. I have a model, so I'll virtually wander inside the castle. Then I'll talk about the end of Miyazaki's dream, which will answer the question of why Lupin throws away the fake bills. Oh god, sorry it was long, but if I don't talk about what happened to Telecom and Little Nemo, the lecture about the castle of Cagliostro would end up incomplete. Now the result. What the? It looks so weird. <laughs> I don't like this new display style. <laughs> what a strange design. Okay, now I'll slack for the next two minutes, so please use the restroom while I do that. Okay, please switch to the pay part. Thank you for watching until the end. I am the most famous otaku king in Japan, otaku king Toshio Okada. I started planning to talk overseas about animations and movies popular in Japan in English. Before long, I'm planning to add English subtitles to movie talking in Japanese, so please look forward to it. If you ask a, com a question in this comment field of this video, maybe I will talk about comments as a theme. We welcome the people who are interested in the forefront of Japanese otaku culture and those who want to hear stories of interesting animations and movies. So please sub subscribe our channel. If there is good relation, I will get better and I will do my best. <laughs> Thanks.